So, our first lecture. Uh, Richard and Pratik, they came from New York. So they just came for OpenFest. What they're going to talk about is actually time series database, and they will explain us more about the tooling that we can use in Wogging. Now, we all know how important is Wogging within a production environment and also in startup companies, because this is also a critical factor either you're going to success, because what you want to do is always keep track of the user flow and uh, exceptions and all these things. So they will be talking about the right tooling, what we can use, how we can scale all these metrics, and how we can have everything on time. Please welcome them. Hey, can you guys hear me? Awesome. Hi, I'm Pratik. That's Richard, Richie for short. Um, we're both going to talk to you about our experience building time series databases and especially like large volume ones. Um, and the, the sort of in production there refers to the fact that we had to build these systems while there was already a system in place. So think of it akin to changing like the engine of a car when the car is already driving. We couldn't take downtime. We couldn't do any maintenance windows. We had to be reliable. We had to be up the entire time we were doing this. Um, Quick aside about, is that in? Sorry, technical difficulties. Perfect. Uh, quick aside about who we are, where we work. We're both engineers at Uber. Um, show of hands, how many of you guys know what Uber is? Awesome. I was like hoping that you guys at least knew what it was. Um, quick thing, we match riders and drivers. We used to be in Sofia, I think, two years ago. Something happened. Uh, we're not there anymore. Um, we are in 600 other cities. It's about 20,000 people, about 2,500 engineers. And engineers um, basically log everything to a central system. It's called the M3 system, the metrics team for the entire companies, basically the team we work on. Um, every engineer that sort of logs anything about reliability, so how long it took for a person to get a ride, is my system up? All these metrics are logged to the central system. Um, and I don't know how familiar you guys are with engineers, but they have a preponderance to just like, log everything. Is it going to be useful? They don't really know. They always just say maybe and then log it to the system. And that induces a large number of metrics. And you'll see what the scale is here in a second. Um, but for like a quick example of like what you might want to measure, right? So we were taking a trip from the sort of assembly hall down here. And uh, something that everyone has to measure is basically how long it took for a person to get it right. So the latency of since you opened the phone and clicked a button, how long did that take? Uh, and then further, you sort of want to measure that in every city every version of the app, iOS, Android, how long is it taking based on the back-end version, and you want to see these things change over time. Um, you alert on these things basically, so if it took me longer than a minute, someone somewhere got alerted and told that, you know, something bad's happening, please take a look at this, like maybe there's not enough drivers on the road, maybe we need to put incentives in place, maybe the system's not actually logging metrics, et cetera, right? Like, these are a lot of metrics. Um, the first thing people, like, when I say something like this is, they ask, why is this hard, right? You have 1,000 metrics, 10,000 metrics, a million metrics. It's not really hard. Get a time series database. There's a bunch of them out there. Save the values, you're done. Like, why are there two of you? Why is there less than like, one person doing this? It's not a hard problem. And you'd be right. Like, honestly, if you have anything up to like, the scale of a few hundred thousand millions of metrics, you could probably use something off the shelf or even pay a vendor, and it would work. For us, unfortunately, the problem was whenever we were building the system, and even to date, there's nothing at scale that worked for us that was cost effective. Um, and as a result, we had to sort of build these things for ourselves. Um, a quick catch up about what the scale looks like for us. Um, that's what the number of metrics looks like raw coming into the system. So think every engineer when they emit metrics, per second they emit something like 400 to 700 million metrics. That variation comes based on traffic. So you know, at the middle of Halloween and New Year's Eve, you see a lot more traffic than you do Sunday morning at 9 a.m. when a conference is running, right? Because no one is coming. Uh -huh. But that's sort of every second these metrics are unaggregated, basically emitted from the client raw. We aggregate them post hoc. So we aggregate into like 10 seconds. So imagine if you emit a counter every second, you can only store one value every 10 seconds. And we also aggregate at the one minute mark. These are basically what we store in the database itself. Um, that comes down to from 700 to about 30 million metrics a second. It's a lot of data. Um, and further, it's about 9 billion different IDs. So you know, I, was talk I was talking about like, the one sort of city metric, the P99 latency, the iOS version, the Android version. Think of all these combinations. They together blew up combinatorial. 
and it comes to something like 9 billion metrics, and these all need to be indexed further. Um, that's the scale on the ingest side. On the query side, people sort of use it in two ways. One is for real-time alerting. We have 150,000 real-time alerts that run every minute on the minute. And basically, these are the kinds of things that people do with like, OK, maybe there's every combination of like, you know, what city, what version. Let me know if this person took longer than a certain amount of time. Some of these are manually curated with manual thresholds. Some of these are with anomaly detection. Sometimes it's a combination of the two. But as you can tell, there's a lot of alerts. And the other side is people use this for debugging. So they'll load up a dashboard of, OK, show me everything that's happening around. So like the number of people that are currently in a trip, the current number of drivers that are driving around. Um, you might do this post hoc. You might do this when there's an outage. You might do this for capacity planning and a bunch of other use cases. Um, and that's sort of the standard process. And it comes down to, again, 30 billion data points a second, 2,500 queries per second. And we can dig into this more in the question and answer section if you guys have any questions. Um, further, so quick uh, sort of an anecdote. This is always growing, right? Um, the slides that I showed you, Richie updated, like, I think, uh, two, three days ago. We originally were planning on using slides that we already had from four months ago for another presentation we used. And to our surprise, when he updated the slides, all the numbers jumped up 50%. Like, we knew that the numbers grew a lot, but we didn't, in ourselves, like, have a perception of how much it constantly keeps growing. We thought it would flatline, maybe it was a 30% growth, but it was already actually 50% growth, uh, which is really surprising and sort of demonstrates how much it keeps growing. It hasn't slowed down yet. Since we built the system to today, we've seen something like a 900x growth. Um, and again, not slowing down. Um, quick history of M3. So it's talking about how we could never use open source technology just off the shelf. We tried. That's the first thing we did. Um, we used something called Graphite. And there were lots of problems with this thing. It was like the sort of state of the art when we started, like 2010. And this is before the M3 team existed. Um, there was this central system that stored all the metrics. And every time we had to do any maintenance, so a single host going down for an upgrade, or we're expanding the capacity because it was experiencing a lot of growth and we need to expand the number of metrics we can store, all of these things required downtime for the entire cluster, which is just untenable, right? Like, imagine telling Uber that, yeah, for like the next hour, you can't get metrics because the metrics team's expanding the cluster. Like, that just wasn't acceptable. So we formed a team around this effort and we created the M3 team. Um, the first thing we did was make something that looked like graphite but it was backed with like a scalable store. So we used Cassandra, and we just put a bunch of services in front to make it look very similar to Graphite. It spoke the same APIs, basically. And it worked really well. And in the first year, it experienced like a 16x growth year over year, 2015 to 2016, and it, yeah, it worked. I mean, no one in the team, you know, the company was any of the wiser. All the users got much better reliability than they did with Graphite, and we sort of were happy with the system. Um, unfortunately, it gets very expensive. By the time we migrated off Cassandra, there was something like 1,700 hosts. And I don't know how many of you guys have done any Cassandra admin. At 1,700 hosts, there's a bunch of administrative things that happen. You're always going to have some disks that fail. And our team was like, what, 10 people at that time? Like, someone was always on call, and someone was always changing hardware based on, oh, a disk went down, or, oh, there's a network partition, or something like that. And operationally, it was super cumbersome for us to maintain the system. And further, it was just super expensive. And the reason it's expensive, if you think about it, is our metric workload, right? Most of it is write once, read sometimes, and never update. Because basically, when the person emits a metric, they're never going to go back and be like, no, nah, I was wrong. I'm going to update it in the, in the sort of future. They don't care. Because like, once you've emitted a metric, the most valuable metric is at that time, never in the past. Um, as a result, Cassandra isn't the optimal store for this. You have to compact a lot to make Cassandra efficient. And because of these compactions, we needed to run Cassandra on very beefy hardware. So CPUs, uh, at least 24 to 32 CPU, uh, core CPUs, um, at least 8 to 10 drives. And these things started getting super expensive. Because of how expensive they were, unfortunately, we had to change our RF from RF3 to RF2 just to make it more cost effective for us to run, which meant that we were trading reliability for scalability, which is not something we wanted to do. And further, like, repairs were just terrible. So like, we couldn't actually even be reliable with Cassandra. So despite the fact that users were happy, us as operators and developers of the system, we weren't happy. We had to do a lot to make this work. So you know, towards 2016, towards the end of it, or towards the beginning of 2016, I should say, we realized that this was untenable. And we sort of tried to figure out, what should we do next? This works for now, but it's not going to work a year from now, especially the scale we're growing. Sorry about that. Yeah, so we took a look around and we were like, okay, we're going to build something, we're going to see what's available, what's the quickest thing we can do to like, build a scalable so solution. Um, 
we decided to build M3DB. And M3DB is this open source distributed time series database. And the thing I want to really drive home is there's a bunch of properties about the system, and there's a bunch of text on the slide. But almost everything that we built and that we realized came out of our experience from having supported two previous versions of the system, so Graphite and Cassandra. And a lot of our design choices came from that experience. So we saw that you know, Cassandra compactions were super expensive for our workload. We wanted to build a system that would avoid that because it would be cheaper for us. The same thing with Cassandra using gossip for membership, um, which is basically how it figured out you know, which clusters or which nodes in the cluster have which shards. Um, it, was, it uses gossip, which works well in certain cases, but when your clusters grow, when you have a lot of network partitions, it, it doesn't. Um, and as a result, we used an alternative. We used at CD with Rafts. Um, and again, don't sort of focus on the details, but focus more on the fact that this came out of things that we knew didn't work and we knew that we needed alternatives. Um, this is like a, a pseudo architecture diagram of everything that's involved in building such a database. Each one of those boxes is things we could probably spend hours and hours on. We obviously do not have hours and hours today, so I'm going to focus on a subset of this. Basically, how the read path started out, what was involved in a database serving a read when we built it at the very beginning, how that changed over time, and what that looks like today. And that's the remainder of our talk. Um, so first off, 2016, like I already told you, Cassandra was working fine operate, like, from a user perspective, but operationally it wasn't. And we were looking around, like, what could we do? Could we just use an open source piece of technology? That'd be ideal. We really did not want to write something ourselves. Um, we looked around, and unfortunately, nothing really existed. Um, Graphite was very much state of the art. I see some prom t-shirts in the, in the crowd, and like prom was sort of just getting to be something. But it still wasn't like a very large, scalable store. It was very much meant as a, a smaller system that required a bigger back end. And we couldn't use it. Um, we looked around, asked for vendor quotes, because again, we didn't want to build something. And all the quotes we got, they were about 10x more expensive than our current system. And we wanted to be 10x cheaper. Right? So that was definitely not tenable for us to do. Um, we did look around, and we were looking at more research. Because obviously, the solutions weren't there, but maybe the core ideas existed in research. And they did. Um, Facebook had published a paper around that time called Gorilla, based about a system that they were using time series compression, this specialized compression for this domain of data, and how they were serving all their recent alerts and everything out of memory. And we really liked the, the profile that they described, the, the sort of attributes of the system. So we took it, and we were like, maybe we can do something similar. Um, they unfortunately hadn't published code at that time, so we very much took the raw ideas and built our own version. Um, quick aside, what does that time series compression actually look like? So think about what time series data looks like, right? You basically have a timestamp and a value, eight bytes for each at every data point. So think about how you have these three data points. And the idea very much comes from how, variation, how little variation there is in these values. So think about the dates, right? If you have these values that are being aggregated every 10 seconds or being emitted every second, the variation in these bytes, so between the first one and the second one, the delta in the times is very small. Further, the variation between the delta of deltas between subsequent values is very, very small. It's none. So you can capture that in a more succinct manner. Rather than using eight bytes per timestamp, you can capture eight bytes of the first one and the variation, or the variation of the variation, as there's no variation, actually. right? So basically, a single bit for the fact that nothing's changed. And you save a bunch of bytes that way. Um, that's for the timestamp side. They do some other encodings for the float values themselves. Um, they do XOR encoding, and we do some stuff on top of it to be a little bit more efficient. Um, so we did some benchmarks, right? I, I, as good engineers do, we, like, we took some ideas, took a subset of our workload, and were like, what does it look like? like so we took a bunch of code, and none of this was production code. Like, really hacked up something to see what the performance characteristics looked like, what the compression ratio looked like, and we really liked what we saw. Um, we basically got an 11x improvement on our production workload over Cassandra. And at 11x of the, the working set, you can actually start to consider storing all that data in memory. Right? If we had to store the entire data set that Cassandra was having in memory, it wouldn't have worked for us. It was just too expensive. RAM, this is even 2015, it's not cheap, it's not free. Uh, but at 11x compression, it was cheap enough that we could afford to do it. So that's what we started off with. Um, and I, I won't dig into sort of the details, but if you're curious, the code's there, and we'll publish a blog about it pretty soon. Um, so you know, 2016, the middle of the year, this is June. We've done these benchmarks. Everything looks good. What should we do? Like, we, we decided that we have a bunch of clusters. Um, some clusters are for two-day retention. Some are for longer retentions. And the two-day ones were the hottest. They were the ones that were super expensive. They were the ones that were always overloaded, that needed all the maintenance. So we decided to target that one first. And we were like, we'll build a system that fixes that problem. And then we'll look at what happens at the end of that after. So we have a goal in mind. We have our ideas. Let's start developing, right? Um, Quick architecture deep dive. Think about a write that comes in. 
this is very much modeled like a traditional RDBMS where you have some state in memory and you have some state on disk. So we have write ahead log. We call that write ahead log a commit log. That's what is on the bottom of that picture. And at the top of the picture, there's some state that's in memory to start. These are those TSZ or M3TSZ compressed blocks. Basically, that compression that I was showing you, it's a streaming compression. So as you get values, you keep compressing in memory. Um, we block that based on time. So periodically, like every two hours is how we started, we would say that you know, all this data is now considered immutable, and we're going to rotate it out into a subsequent section. When we rotate it out, it, we kept it in memory, and we also wrote it out to disk. Basically, think of it like a snapshot file and a write ahead log, very similar to how an RDBMS does it. For us, we call these file set files and write ahead log or commit log. Um, you already had these file set files in case you needed to do restart so you could recover the state, and you could use a combination of that and the, the write ahead log to never lose any data. You could always recreate the state in memory regardless. And because you have all the state in memory, all your reads and writes should be really good. Um, the layout on disk based on this is always temporal. So think about what the nice property of the system where as I'm writing these things out, because I know that all the data for a certain time range is contained in a certain file, as I have to call these, as I have to evict them based on retention, because my first cluster was only two days, I could just remove them, right? I need to rewrite any files. So what I'm trying to get at is we could avoid compactions. Again, that thing that we didn't like about our earlier system, we didn't get or we didn't do because we specifically designed around not having to do it. Um, and again, just as you keep rolling forward, you create new files due to the old ones, and the system sort of keeps rolling forward. Um, quick sort of jump into what the data read path looks like. Everything is in memory. There are two maps. The map on the left is basically from the series identifier to some series object. So the series identifier is that unique combination of all the tags, so what city, what iOS version, what Android version, what metric you're tracking. The sort of combination of that is a single unique identifier, and that goes to a series. And then the series is in the second map, which is basically those periodic blocks. So 12 PM basically representing all the data from 12 PM to 2 PM, and so on. And the values in that map are those compressed blocks, those M3TSZ compressed things. So if you want to serve a read or a write, you go to this memory structure, and everything is really quick. Right? It's basically get a lock, make sure everything's there, give it back to the user. Never hit disk, and it works really well. Um, and it did work really well. We, that's the result of when we rolled out towards the end of 2016. We were significantly cheaper in terms of the amount of data volume. We went from 1,400 terabytes to 200 terabytes, despite an RF increase. And that's because of the improved uh, sort of compression that we were doing with the M3TSZ compression. Um, further, our read performance improved substantially, just because we were serving out of memory rather than having to hit disk like Cassandra was. And the other part is the, how much cheaper it got, which was, again, one of the goals. Um, think about those two slopes, right? The y-axis is cost. The x-axis is the number of series. Both Cassandra and M3DB scale horizontally. As a result, they are like linear lines. But in that case, like, slopes do matter, as you can see. The, number of, the amount of money you have to spend for the same number of series is substantially lower for something like M3DB. Because it's cheaper, it requires less nodes to store the same number. And we really like that property. Um, so we're all done, right? Like, 2016, data is being served out of memory, problem solved. We can stop and go home. Why are we here? Rishi? <laughs> <coughs> yeah, so um, basically, uh, we deployed this to production. Uh, everything worked perfectly the first time, and uh, we never had to touch it again. Um, not really. Uh, <laughs> So this worked for a little, a little bit of time. Um, but basically what started happening is, like Pratik was saying earlier, the, when we deployed this stuff to production, um, Uber was experiencing a really like, massive amount of growth and the amount of things that we wanted to monitor. Uh, and basically every day, every week, every month, the number of new time series that were coming in um, was so high that we had to keep adding hardware to this cluster at a rate that we felt was like, really unsustainable. Um, on top of that, we kind of did some digging into how much of the data we were keeping in memory and being storing was actually being used. Uh, and we found that pretty much even though people are emitting millions, billions of series, they only ever look at like a tiny fraction of that. Um, so it was really like wasteful in terms of like money and memory utilization to be keeping all this stuff in memory. Um, and we had bigger clusters that we wanted to move to M3DB. So we're like, okay, well, let's using all this memory, and like, unsurprisingly, it's like all the compressed data. Um, so when we look at like heap graphs of our uh, production nodes, we saw that like 75% of all the memory being used was just these compressed data blocks. We're like, okay, that should be like a relatively easy problem to solve, right? Um, we'll just take that data, move it to disk, and just find some way to read it. Um, we're like, okay, we already have a data file, right? 
Um, like Pratik said earlier, we wrote out these compressed file set files on a regular basis, um, but those files were designed for recovery, not for reads at runtime. Um, so if you take a look at one of those, what one of those files looks like, and I'm, I'm sorry about the colors, they work normally on my laptop. Um, <laughs> works on my machine, right? Uh, okay, so you can think of our data file as being a, a collection of tuples, right? And every tuple contains an ID and a compressed data block. So the ID is the name of the thing you're measuring, right? This is like P99 latency for all requests to this endpoint for this mobile app version for this version of the backend. Um, and the data is the actual compressed TZ block. Uh, and then the data file itself is just a, compre uh, you know, a collection of these entries. And the problem with that is if you want to try and use that file and read it at runtime, uh, there's no efficient way to do it, right? Because it's, there's no index over this thing so if someone says, I'm looking for the data for this series, you'd have to go and read the whole thing. Um, so our existing file format didn't really work for what we were trying to accomplish. Um, so what we decided to do is we, we said, okay, let's try and make, again, we're already kind of running this in production, so whatever changes we have to make, we have to upgrade our clusters live. Um, so we're like, let's try and make the minimum kind of possible changes we can here to make this work. Uh, what we decided to do was to move the IDs out of the data file. Um, and instead, we created a new file called the index file. Um, and the index file uh, is similar to the data file in that it's a collection of tuples. Uh, and it stores the ID. But instead of storing the actual data, you just store offsets into the data file. And then, basically, what we decided to do was the data file could now be moved out of memory completely to disk. Um, and that would get rid of like 75% of like all our memory utilization. Um, and now we wouldn't be using more data as the number of like data points that came in grew. And then, uh, whoops. And then the ID file, uh, the index file could just be kept in memory. Um, so we're like, we'll just keep the index file in memory. Like we're kind of already doing that anyways. Um, and since we're storing the data file offsets in memory, uh, when we need to go find a series, we can just jump directly into the data file. Um, and that's basically about as fast as looking things up on disk can be. Um, so this is kind of the beginning, beginning of 2017, um, and this is kind of the, the picture that Pratik showed earlier, where you have the, um, the lookup from series to series object that hasn't changed. Uh, and then before, what we had is in the series object, you had a lookup from time to the compressed data blocks, right? So what we were doing before is storing the actual data in memory. Uh, and what we changed that to was, so instead of storing the compressed data blocks in memory, um, like I said, we're kind of moving the index file into memory, so we're just storing offsets into the data file. So now when uh, a request comes in to read series foo, uh, we go to series foo, we look at the block start, we're like, okay, they want to read the 12 p.m. block, what's the data file offset? Okay, I know exactly where that lives in the data file. Um, and we can just go read it. Um, and to, to be clear here, like when we're, we're showing some of these diagrams, these are kind of like, um, we're kind of showing high level changes to our architecture. There's obviously, um, there's a lot of stuff that you have to do, kind of auxiliary work around this type of stuff to make these types of things fast. For example, um, you know, basically going to disk is like the slowest thing you can do, right? It's like three to six x or three to six orders of magnitude slower than reading from memory. So when we do this type of stuff, um, uh, and we wanted to support spinning disk in SSDs, so uh, we do a lot of batching to make sure that when we do go to disk, we're trying to make it as linear as possible, and that you batch reads together so you're trying to travel in a straight line. Uh, and of course, you know, like good software engineers, we put a giant cache in front of everything because that's how you solve half of problems in uh, programming is you just add a cache. Um, so uh, that actually worked for a little while. Um, we got our two-day cluster into like a pretty healthy spot. Um, we felt like the rate that we were adding hardware relative to the number of series that we were adding was like pretty sustainable and healthy. Um, the problem was, like I said before, that wasn't our only cluster, right? We had um, several 40-day clusters as well. Um, and when we tried to move those clusters to M3DB, we just ran into the same problem again where we just immediately started running out of memory. Um, and the problem with that is the, our existing implementation works really great for clusters uh, that have short retentions, so like a 48-hour uh, cluster. Um, but like Pratik said, when in our aggregation tier, we create 10-second uh, tiles and one-minute tiles. So the data that's aggregated at 10-second blocks is stored for two days but we also store data that's aggregated uh, at one minute period for 40 days. Um, and those clusters have much longer retention. And if you kind of think about what we described here with like this index being in memory, 
that index is basically going to grow almost linearly with the retention of your clusters, right? The longer period of time that you're storing data, the more blocks that you're keeping, the more kind of like metadata that you're going to have telling you where to go look for stuff on disk. Um, so for example, with our 24, our two-day cluster where we had a two-hour block side, uh, you would have 24 hour blocks, 24 hours worth of blocks in memory. Um, when you change that to a 40 day cluster with a six hour block size, you end up with around 160 blocks. So it's gonna require a lot more metadata um, and the approach that worked for the two day cluster just wasn't gonna work here. Um, so we knew we had to do something different. Um, we're like, okay, we've seen this problem before, right? We had too much stuff in memory. All we had to do was take that stuff out of memory, put it on disk uh, and just find an easy way to read it, right? Shouldn't be too hard. Uh, this actually turned out to be a lot harder than solving the previous problem. Um, whoops. And the, the main crux of the problem becomes, okay, if we're gonna move all of the metadata out of memory, then how do you read the data, right? Uh, because the first thing is, you don't even know when someone comes to you and says, hey, I wanna read series foo, you don't even know if you have series foo on disk, right? So like I said before, going to disk is like the most expensive thing you can do. And you definitely don't want to do it if you know you're just going to go to disk uh, looking for a series that doesn't exist. So that was the first problem. Uh, the second problem we knew how to solve is that before, kind of with our index metadata thing, we were storing offsets into the data file in memory. Um, and if you move that data out of memory, then it's like, okay, even if I know I have series foo, where do I go to look for it? Like, I know it's in this file, but I have no idea where. Uh, and obviously, it's going to be way too slow to scan the entire uh, data file every time just to read a single series. Um, and again, we were already running M3DB on a lot of hardware, uh, and we had so much hardware that we couldn't really afford to just like deploy a whole new version of our stack and like dual write for some period of time and do like a nice clean migration. Uh, kind of like Pratik said, we had to kind of rip out the engine and replace it while we kept serving traffic. So whatever solution we came up with, we needed to be able to do a live migration. Um, so we decided to tackle the first problem first, and the first problem is again, how do you figure out what data you even have so that you can avoid going to disk when you don't have to? Um, and when we had the metadata in memory, it was really easy, right? We had a gigantic global map. You just look up the series in the map. If it's there, then you also have it on disk. If it's not, then you don't have it. Uh, and when that moves to disk, then you can't do that. Uh, <laughs> uh, so. I don't want to spend too much time on how these work, uh, but the solution we ended up coming up with was to use a bloom filter. Uh, and I don't want to spend too much time explaining them, uh, just not a data structures class and don't have a lot of time. But the basic idea is you can think of a bloom filter as behaving exactly like a set. Um, you have an API that lets you put stuff in it, uh, and then another API that tells you um, if you've ever put that thing in it before. Um, but the, the difference with bloom filters versus sets, <laughs> again, I'm brushing over a lot of details, is that bloom filters, um, they use a lot less memory than the equivalent set would, uh, but in exchange for less memory consumption, you pay this price where they have like a configurable number of false positives. So sometimes you'll ask the bloom filter, hey, have you seen this thing before? And it'll say yes, but actually it's never been seen. Um, and what that means in practice for M3DB is that sometimes if we use a bloom filter to determine what's on disk and what's not, Sometimes we will end up going to disk, despite the fact that the data is not there. Um, but that turns out to be okay. Um, and I think this slide kind of drives that home. Basically, if you have a million series you keep trying to keep track of, um, and you want to make sure you have a false positive rate of less than 1%, uh, and in this case, a false positive rate of less than 1% means that 99% of time when you go to disk looking for something, you know you're going to find it. Um, if you want to accomplish that, then you can accomplish that with a bloom filter and 16 megabytes of memory. Um, to get the equivalent kind of like effect with a, with a map, it would take 400 megabytes of memory. Um, so you get a 20x savings, which is pretty nice um, and basically gives you good enough performance characteristics to make this feasible. Um, inc incidentally, this is also how Cassandra, Cassandra does something very similar, right? But because Cassandra has to spend a lot of time looking through SS tables to find data, um, they keep a, like a bloom filter around for every table and they'll consult the bloom filter first before they go looking something. Uh, that way they can satisfy like this key does not exist queries really quickly. Um, and if you think about this though, the, the kind of the beginning for solving this entire problem began with us saying um, we need to not keep things in memory for every block, right? Because if we have things that scale linearly with the number of blocks, 
uh, then we're never going to be able to support long, long retention clusters. Um, it actually turns, and that's true, and technically we do have to keep one of these bloom filters around for every block, but it turns out that the, perform the memory impact is so negligible that in practice it doesn't matter, and even with a five-year cluster, these things take almost no memory. Cool, so that was the first problem, right? We needed to find a like, fast, performant, efficient way to determine if we need to go to disk. Uh, but the much harder problem was like, okay, I know I have series foo, I just don't know where it is, right? I know it's in this file, but I don't want to read the whole file to find it. Um, yeah, so we can't just read the entire in index file each time. It'd, like, be way too slow. Um, so the solution we came up with was like, oh, we'll just sort the index file, right? That's easy. Uh, we don't have to change the file, the structure of the index file. We'll just sort it before we write it out. And then we can just do a binary search, right? Like, we've all written a binary search. We all know how they work. Uh, this shouldn't be too hard. Um, so we thought this would be, like, the easiest way to do this. Um, turns out it's not. Uh, and the problem is you, you don't think about this too often when you're doing a binary search. But in order to do a binary search over a data structure, um, that data structure has to provide direct random access to its entries. Um, and the reason you don't really think about that when you talk about binary search is because normally when you do a binary search, it's over an array in memory, right? Uh, and arrays in memory give you direct random access almost by definition, right? They're indexed. Um, the problem is we weren't trying to binary search uh, an array. We were trying to binary search a file. Um, and the entries in the file are not fixed width. So if you take, another, you take a look at our index file again, um, it's a collection. Again, I'm really sorry about the colors. Uh, it's a collection of entries, and each entry is an ID and an offset into the data file. So here's our like, complete uh, index file. Um, and obviously, each ID is not going to be the same length, right? Like, the, if something's called P99 latency and something's called like request per second service foo, um, those aren't going to be the same length. So if we start inserting things into our index file, so let's call this series end-to-end -end latency P99, We'll call this one request success and the next one total count. Uh, you can see right away that these entries are completely different sizes. And if you try and do like a bitewise binary search, you're going to end up in the middle of these files. Um, and you can't do binary search that way. Uh, so <laughs> we're like, okay, well, we know how to solve things, right? You just add another layer of indirection, always. Uh, so that's what we did. Um, and we created a, a new type of file called our summaries file. Uh, and we're like, okay, what we can do is create a new representation that basically represents a tiny fraction of our index file. Um, and that'll be small enough to hold in memory. And then what we can do is we can binary search that uh, kind of like summarized representation, and that'll give us a good enough location into the index file to begin a linear scan. Uh, and the way this works is if your summary file represents 1% of the index file, then at most, you'll only ever have to scan 1% of the index file. Um, and because linear scans are basically the fastest way to do disk I.O., this turns out to be a pretty fast way to look things up. Um, so here's our summaries file and here's our index file. Uh, and if you remember with um, our data files, there's a one-to-one -one mapping between everything in the index file and everything in the data file. Uh, but in the summaries file, uh, you only have a small fraction of the index file, uh, which means that now we can move the entire index file and the entire data file onto disk so we can evict basically almost everything we're holding in memory. And all that's left is these tiny summaries files. Um, and again, this is, we're kind of doing this trick again where it's like technically we're keeping things in memory that scale with a number of blocks. But again, even in a cluster with five years of retention, these things don't even show up in the heap allocations. They're very, very small. Um, cool. So what I want to do now is that was kind of a lot of information. So I want to step through like a quick animation that shows kind of what the read path looked like in Q1 of 2018, and this is actually still our, our current architecture. Um, so let's say you're looking for the series cat, right? For some reason, your metrics keep track of the number of cats in your production system. Um, and the first thing you need to do, like I said before, is you need to uh, ask the appropriate Bloom filter, hey, have you ever seen the series cat before? Is this likely to be on disk? Should I go look for it? And let's say for the sake of argument that in this case it is. So you know that cat exists on disk, you just don't know where, so you need to go find it. And like we said before, the first thing that we do is we start by looking at the summaries file. Um, and the way we look at the summaries file is we have binary search, because it's easy to binary search things that are in memory. Um, I want to give a, a minor caveat here. Um, normally when you do a binary search, right, you're trying to do an exact match. Like, you're look, like if you're looking for cat, then you're trying to find the cat series in memory. Um, that's not what we're doing. Our binary search is basically 
trying to, because the summaries file, like, tells you where stuff exists in the index file, what you're trying to do with your binary search is just constrain the, um, the portions of the index that you need to scan. Um, so what we're doing is we're binary searching the summaries file, trying to find the best place in the index file to begin our linear scan. So let's say that this red bar, wow, that's yellow, are you kidding me? Um, these displays are really annoying me. Okay, so you can kind of see it where the second arrow is three boxes over. Uh, man, this sucks. Um, that's the entry we're looking for. Sorry, it looks normal on my Mac. Um, that's the entry we're looking for, right? Uh, just bear with me a little bit. Um, so that's our target. So the first thing we do, okay, at least those work. <laughs> uh, you jump into the summaries file. Um, and you start your binary search in the middle. And the current value that you found in the summary file is dog. So dog is lexicographically to the right of cat, right? D comes after C in the alphabet. So you know that if you started a linear scan of the index at that location, you would miss what you're looking for. You've already gone past it. So you just do your binary search to the left, and then the next value we see is barn. Barn is lexicographically to the left of cat. B comes before C. So you know if you jump into the index file at that location, you could conceivably find what you're looking for. So that's what we do. Um, we jump into the index file and do a linear scan. Um, so barn is obviously not what we're looking for, so we jump to the next entry. Oops, a little too fast here. Uh, so the next entry is uh, boat. Boat is also before cat, lexicographically, so we know we haven't gone too far, but it's not what we're looking for. And then finally, we end up on our target. This is the series that we were looking for. So we've now found the index entry. Um, and then to, the final thing we need to do is actually get the data. The index file stores offsets into the data file. So now we basically have all the information we need to jump directly to the location on disk and start reading bytes um, and streaming them back to our client. Now, if you look at this, it actually it seems like we're doing a lot of I.O. Uh, but in practice, it's really not that bad. The reason being because all that binary search in the summaries file, that's all in memory, super quick. And then when we do go into the index file, um, it's all linear scans. So if you do have to read from disk, the fastest way to do it is linearly. Um, so in practice, all we have to do is two random seeks. Um, and two random seeks is actually not bad. Um, that's about as good as you're gonna get with like an RDMS or something. Um, and like I said before, there's a lot of batching and like a giant LRU cache in front of all of this. So if you're reading the same series over and over again, you're not gonna be doing this constantly. Cool, all right, Pratik, are we finally done? The click on it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, no, as you'd imagine, the answer is always gonna be no, right? We started out saying that we were done because we finished one workload. And very much similar to that, we're done for the purposes of all the workloads we run at. So right now we have clusters that use two-day retention, that have five-year retention, and everything in the middle. We have some clusters that have all of that in a single cluster. Um, and for all of those purposes, M3DB works really well for us. Um, and we're really happy with all the performance characteristics and so on. But all the auxiliary work that we're doing to make it easy to use, et cetera, is still ongoing. It's never ever going to be done because we're going to keep adding new workloads. Like we recently added a reverse index. We recently added all sorts of like performance things. So like Rishi did something with snapshotting to make bootstraps faster. Right? There's always more things that you can do, but the core of the database we think is in a really good place, and we really like our deployments. Like no longer is everyone changing a, a random host every day. No longer do we have to like do operational things at 4 a.m. For the most part, things are very good. They're automated. They're quicker. Um, all of this to say, you know. Databases have been really hard. They are really hard to develop, but they're also really fun. But that's not really what we want you to get out of this, right? Like, not everyone's going to have the time and the luxury to like write a database from scratch, and they shouldn't. So what we are trying to get to you isn't that like you should develop databases, but you should build software in a particular way. And the way you should think about this is, let's say I asked you to build me a car. We were coming down from like assembly hall where hotel was down here, and let's say I wanted to get down from there to here. If I asked you to make me a car, you could do it in one of two ways. You could sort of build it a component at a time. So you build a wheel, you build an axis, you build a chassis, and sort of end to end now the car's available, right? Or you could build it in terms of building incremental pieces of technology. So like you could build first a skateboard, then a scooter, then a bicycle, then a motorcycle. And what we're trying to drive really hard is we built software the second way, not the first way. And the point is when you do it the second way, every single time you can make an incremental improvement. You could get from assembly hall to tech park quicker, right? Like it wasn't that um, you had to wait until the entire thing was done. There's no way I could just take some wheels and an axi and like get here, right? And that was the, the point. So when you build software, please do try to build it the second way. Uh, and that's what we do. Um, with that, I'd like to say thank you. Almost all the code we have is open source. Not almost, literally all the code we have is open source. 
Um, it's a Apache V2. If you guys are at all curious, if you want to use it, please do feel free. There is um, really good. There are really good docs up there. There's a forum. There's a chat where you can engage us. We're also here, obviously, if you want to talk to us in person. And all the slides are available up there. With that, we'd like to say thank you so much for having listened to us. And if you have any questions, we're all ears. Thank you very much once again. We have time only for one question. So do we have any questions now? All right, on third microphone. Right, so um, do you know of any large users of M3DB outside of Uber? That's a really good question. Um, there's a really big Chinese retailer that I can't name yet. But uh, I think the biggest Chinese retailer, they just deployed to production with us. Uh, and that's been really exciting. So a lot of the work that we've been doing, like you saw the 2018 Q1 was when we did this. Between then and now, we've basically been adding all these features to make M3DB much easier to use. Um, Richie likes to draw this analogy that we're squarely in the motorcycle phase, where we work really fast, we get from where we want to go, but we're dangerous. Like you can still pull that front brake and face plant and die, uh, and that's where M3DB is, between that and the car. So we're making all those guardrails, and especially as new users on board, we, we find that you know, they deploy in configurations that we don't, and we have to make new sort of safety guardrails so that they don't hurt themselves. Thank you so much again. All right, thank you very much.